Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, the Hurricane Microbiome Project, Environmental Exposures and Population Health, presented by Joseph Petrosino, Professor and Interim Chairman, Baylor College of Medicine. I am Alexis Krauss of Labberts, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring in this educational web seminar presented by Labberts. Labberts is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of online virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Petrosino. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Look. Thank you to Labroots for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all about uh, a new project we have going on in our laboratory, um, very unique for microbiome studies as far as at least I'm concerned, uh, and hopefully one that you'll find uh, both uh, educational and uh, interesting at the same time. Um, so I'm gonna start off with an overview for our, for our talk for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm gonna touch on some learning objectives that I isolated uh, and identified for uh, for this talk. Uh, describe a little bit of background of how we approach translational microbiome research here at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, a little bit of detail about Hurricane Harvey that struck just about a little over a year ago. Um, exposures and health concerns that came from Hurricane Harvey and how a team of investigators here in Oregon State University uh, have partnered to study the impact of the microbiome and as it correlates to environmental exposures and health outcomes uh, that have arisen since the storm. Talk a little bit about some preliminary results we found. Uh, it's a little bit descriptive, but just to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at uh, and the future plans for this study. So starting off with our learning objectives, um, our group, as I'll talk about in a moment, has been involved in a number of human microbiomes uh, originating stories, as well as others in the environment and animal health as well. Um, starting before the Human Microbiome Project and all the way till today. Um, in, in each case, each microbiome study has its unique uh, and interesting perspectives and challenges in terms of how to design and implement them, and this is no different. Um, so in, in this case, we'd like to identify um, uh, some, some thoughts about how to deploy a microbiome study during a time of crisis in an affected community. Uh, you can imagine how different people are engaged in various aspects of, of cleanup and pulling their lives together. And at the same time, you're having to engage this community uh, in trying to help identify potential uh, biomarkers and environmental uh, exposures that may lead to better uh, responses in the future for, for if unfortunate events like this occur again. Uh, so we want to identify the research questions that, we, uh, that we're following such a disastrous Hurricane Harvey how we leverage the resources for rapid deployment uh, and acquisition of data from these types of communities. How does one study uh, design a study to access both short and long-term health effects uh, from these exposures? And then what fundamental information should be collected when sampling the human microbiome? It stems from other studies as well, but it applies specifically to uh, uh, this hurricane study as well. So before moving forward, I wanted to take a moment to describe what we mean by translational microbiome research and how we approach it here at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, as many of you probably have observed in the literature, there are a number of studies that have, that have described the microbes, their taxonomy, uh, those individual organisms or communities that are associated with health or disease uh, or treatment and control groups uh, in a particular disease model. This is often interesting and has led to a lot of different hypotheses about how these microbes may be associated with health or disease. But in reality, it takes functional experiments with uh, model systems to be able to dissect how the host microbe relationship um, is occurring in, this, in a specific disease, what biomarkers and therapeutic targets could be pulled out for new diagnostics or therapeutics, uh, and how they could be 
implement it to better improve uh, human or animal or environmental health. And so this slide captures this uh, sort of a high level. We compare, we approach products by comparing the microbiota in healthy or ill individuals, identifying communities or consortia of strains in these organisms, perhaps even one uh, in these communities, maybe even one strain or even a metabolite that's produced by a microbe, and how these identify uh, or associate with health and disease. Take this back to the laboratory in a model system and, and be able to test hypotheses to identify potential targets for therapeutic development. And these could lead to, to all sorts of implementations to improve human health, including the stratification of clinical trial patients uh, to better, again, address uh, treatments for certain diseases. In 2011, following our interaction with the Human Microbiome Pro uh, Project Phase 1, we started a translational microbiome research center called the Center for Metagenomics and Microbiome Research, where we implemented this translational model uh, for studying uh, the microbiome in a variety of diseases. So this real di diagram starts at the top at 12 o'clock with our sort of our inroad to pretty much any microbiome project uh, that is an, an omics-based exploration, comparing microbes and healthy versus ill individuals. Then dissecting these relationships in animal uh, or other cellular model systems, identifying therapeutic targets that could be developed for eventual translation from the bench back to the bedside. Also very important in this is policy and outreach. How do we educate our general public as well as politicians and regulatory agencies uh, to the benefits of biotherapeutic uh, treatment of disease with microorganisms? Um, and of course, training the next generation of scientists in our educational systems. We also have a commercialization arm uh, where we've launched multiple companies now, but the first of which is Diversogen, which does these uh, or helps with these services, these types of uh, services with pharmaceutical and bio biotech companies. The way that we look at the microbiome um, is, is a element, uh, a component is a precision medicine paradigm. That is, as you walk into a doctor's office, it's becoming more and more clear that just the traditional clinical data that you provide is, is in, the, in the clinical data that are generated through blood samples is, is not enough to be able to discern the various uh, versions of diseases that people get from place to place from time to time. And now we can implement human genomic data, metabolomic data, proteomic data, and now microbiome data, and take it into the context also of the environment that you live in, what part of the world that you live in, what type of diet you consume, what other exposures there are, to be able to better inform treatments that may be better for your, your condition, your part of the world at that given time, as opposed to others in other parts of the world, versus a one treatment for all disease uh, paradigm that, that we've largely lived under for the last since the dawn of medicine. And so the microbiome can definitely have an imprint, uh, an imprint on precision medicine, not just as it's related to ourselves, but because it's also um, a, a component that responds to the environment that we're around. So it's, it's the microbiome is somewhat of a handshake between the environment that we're in and our human genetic uh, backbone, as it were. In our microbiome-based applications, our, our omics-based applications, a lot of what we do is starting out, starts off with a metagenomic or genomic uh, uh, process uh, that's outlined here. And so at the top of the screen, I showed that we are able to collect uh, and design experiments for any type of environment or human condition, uh, collect samples that are, that are applicable for that condition, and by now we've seen pretty much everything. Um, extract DNA and RNA as applicable um, for that particular project, sequence that in a, in a variety of sequencing platforms, again, as applicable for project. We also work with the Human Genome Sequencing Center at Baylor College of Medicine, which is one of the three large-scale NHGRI-funded sequencing centers in the United States. It also offers a uh, large capacity for, uh, and a large variety of sequencing opportunities and, and platforms for us to use. And then, depending on the questions we want to ask, and apply a variety of bioinformatic outputs uh, to the data set to be able to ask what does a microbial community look like in healthy versus ill individuals? What are the genes that are contained in those organisms? So now not just the taxonomy, but also the genetic functions that are encoded by these organisms. We can assemble entire genomes from single organisms, so we can identify specific features of a, of a strain of interest uh, belonging to a specific disease or, or protected cohort. Um, we can also do RNA sequencing. So not only are we getting at the genes that are present in a given sample, but which ones are turned on at a particular disease state or in a particular condition, and pointing more directly at a potential therapeutic or diagnostic target. 
I come from a virology department, and if I didn't talk about viruses, they, they'd lynch me. So I also, we also have been working um, uh, hard at de developing better technologies to sequence and analyze and detect viruses from these types of samples as well. We've built these platforms to be able to do metagenomics at a, at a large scale because when we think about disease, as I alluded to in the precision medicine slide earlier, we want to think about it from a global perspective. We don't want to look at disease just in Houston, Texas, or in one region of the world, we want to be able to study a disease such as type 1 diabetes by studying cohorts from all over the world so that we identify both the common exposures, the common genetic risks, the common microbial signatures that are associated with disease no matter where you're from, and also the unique regional factors that may be different from place to place from time to time. So those may be impacted by diet or the race and ethnic background of a particular part of the world, access to health care, the environment, uh, there are a variety of things that implement that are, are that impact local impl, uh, local occurrences of disease that will be reflected in the microbiome of those those individuals uh, as well. So, being able to do this will take let us to look at both targets that are universal to a given disease and those that are regional as well. So again, better inform uh, a personalized uh, uh, medicine uh, approach to to the disease to studying disease. I'm going to touch just for a second and if I mentioned that we, when you get an association uh, with health and disease, you don't stop there. You need to take it back to the laboratory and dissect those microbial relationships. Uh, we have several faculty at Baylor and, and those these are technologies that some of them uh, implemented elsewhere. Um, being able to study bacteria in mini bioreactors. So you think about the big chemostats that people grow large numbers of organisms or large volumes of organisms in. Uh, Rob Britton here at Baylor has been uh, working with many bioreactors, 15 mil versions of those cultures that you can grow in parallel up to 96 or more at a time to be able to perturb uniquely and, and, and see the effect of a certain drug or a certain microbe and how it impacts a gut community over time in a condition that mimics the gut uh, as well. Uh, Buck Samuel works as, with C. elegans as a, as a model for studying metabolism and other uh, their host features that actually are readily reproducible or associated in C. elegans in the worm model. Um, Mary Estes is a, a virologist, a National Academy member in our department who's used enteroids grown from stem cells collected from biopsies of adult individuals, uh, able to regrow them in the laboratory and differentiate them to create mini guts uh, and be able to introduce microbes and viruses to those mini guts to look at these cell to cell associations that are occurring. Um, uh, not only within uh, the longitudinal digestive tract of a single individual, but across multiple individuals, giving you a, a, uh, an insight on how unique some of these uh, interactions really are. And Alden Swenis uh, has uh, led our germ-free mouse facility that's been going on now for about five years. Uh, it's one of the largest germ-free facilities in the US. I believe at the moment we have over 100 isolators uh, looking at both mice and rats as my, uh, uh, systems that study host micro relationships. I mentioned that we've studied a lot of different diseases. Here's just a, a small snapshot of some of them and, and the uh, people that we've uh, worked with over the, over the last seven years. I estimate over 300, probably 350 projects now with over 200 collaborators from around the world, touching on any disease and uh, that you could probably imagine and some that you may not have thought of to this point in time. It's been a very interesting uh, ADHD science type of approach to, to engage in the microbiome. It's really, you have something that you're interested in one day, uh, that's great, but something else the next day comes up and it's like, oh, that's even more exciting. Um, but it's been amazing to see uh, some of the associations with disease that we've been able to dissect even further over the years. So one project I wanted to talk about uh, today, of course, is with respect to Hurricane Harvey. So for those who aren't familiar, Hurricane Harvey struck uh, August 24th. Um, actually, August 25th, uh, as a category category four hurricane uh, in Houston uh, and the surrounding area. Um, uh, one of the unique features: Houston sees its fair share of uh, hurricanes. I've been here for about 26 years, almost, and um, pretty much every other year there seems to be a hurricane of some some size that that's struck a tropical storm that that rolls through during the summer. But this one was a was unique in the fact that it came over and it stalled over Houston for several days, creating uh, unprecedented flooding in, uh, in the area. Dropped over 50 inches of rain, uh, and affected over 41 counties in Texas. Um, and many were designated, or all of them were designated as federal disaster areas. 
were over a quarter million homes that were damaged and 100,000 in the county that houses Houston uh, alone. As you can imagine, with that kind of uh, deluge, uh, there's all sorts of potential hazards and issues that come from a region that actually is already naturally humid uh, and hot. Um, so there's, uh, and some of these headlines uh, and, and articles sort of capture some of that. But uh, you, you think about, first of all, the evacuation process, and then coming back to your home that's been inundated with water. Um, walls have to be torn out. Um, of course, that generates dust and it releases molds that have been growing uh, both before and then after the storm had set. Um, mosquitoes love, of course, this type of an environment. So there's all, all, all sorts of bad, nasty things that can happen, which is why this is not really a great tourism presentation for the city of Houston. Um, it's a great place to live otherwise. Um, as many of you saw in the news, I think uh, it was an unprecedented the, the amount of community act, uh, uh, engagement in terms of people rescuing one another, uh, people pulling out boats and, and getting, jumping into the water and uh, having no regard for what may be in there to rescue and pull people out. It was, uh, it was actually a pretty amazing sight uh, to experience. Uh, and of course, the additional health concerns uh, that I didn't mention before include involving the the drinking water systems, uh, flood water contamination, the fact that this you're pretty much walking in a potential toxic soup. For those that don't know, Houston's also a, uh, has a huge petrochemical footprint uh, as well. Um, there's a number of chemical and explosive hazards that result from the uh, from breaching the safety systems of these uh, various plants. Um, most again are under control and have measures in place to deal with this, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's 100% foolproof. Of course, we have mentioned mosquitoes and infectious diseases that come from mosquitoes, uh, mold and mildew exposure, and of course, the stress that it brings on uh, specific individuals, uh, or the, the affected individuals. Um, I have, there's people still today that work uh, in our laboratory and are associated with our laboratory that we start talking about this project actually for a certain period of time. They actually they get emotionally um, uh, affected and, and, and you can see it still has a dramatic impact on what some people had to go through because of some, because of what they went through. NIH has a mechanism to um, to better understand and better improve our disaster response program. Um, the DR2 uh, mechanism uh, this is a disaster research response program. Uh, it's a framework to look at the medical and public health aspects of disasters and, and health emergencies. Um, it's, it's managed uh, primarily through NIEHS and Library of Medicine uh, supports a website uh, to, to help engage uh, these types of research programs. And so uh, investigators here at Baylor, led by Cheryl Walker, who directs our Center for Precision Environmental Health, um, gathered a team of individuals, and some of whom are shown here, to build a, uh, to first of all, write grants uh, to support this research, and then also to coordinate the activities so that we can hit the ground running and get some of the baseline measurements that are needed to, to make the research um, most effective. And so um, Melissa Bondi, um, uh, Winnie Hamilton uh, from uh, UT School of uh, University of Texas Houston Health Science Center uh, contributed as well as Elaine Szymanski. Uh And then in Oregon State, uh, Kim Anderson actually provided a very unique perspective to this project that I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Conceptual model is pretty straightforward. Um, it's, it's been discussed in the literature um, uh, most recently in uh, 2014. The idea that after disaster, uh, there's a rapid need assessment and health surveillance program that, uh, that is engaged to look at uh, the recovery from post, uh, the, to, at, during the post-disaster response. Um, it's following this post-disaster response or sort of during it, um, where there's track, there's epidemiologic studies that can be launched to better understand and better prepare for the future. And it's in this latter epidemiologic stage where the DRT, DR2 mechanism uh, is, is most applicable. And that's, that's a time of, that's a period of time that we were most interested in, um, in implementing this, this uh, program that I'm about to describe. So we sat, we sat as a team to, to identify, you know, how can we put together a group of individuals with the resources we have to better inform uh, a response uh, for both public health and population health, um, and to protect those who are most uh, vulnerable in our community. 
And so we wanted to start off with a goal of evaluating the chemical environmental exposures and the health conditions that came up that arose after Harvey um, and to assess the biomarkers associated with these exposures that will inform best practice for the future. Um, and so um, Houston has a number of Superfund sites. And so for those who aren't familiar, uh, the U.S. has identified sites that are, um, that are needed to be cleaned up of toxic and chemical waste. Um, and there's special measures that are under, under that are underway in each of these Superfund sites. Houston has 15 of them uh, in surrounding areas. Again, it's another you know, it's tourism in Houston um, that could potentially pose a, a threat to human health. Um, mold exposures are also a concern. Again, it's a, it's a humid, um, and especially after the hurricane, a very humid environment, very hot, power is out. Um, and so a lot of the pathogens and vectors for these diseases can uh, can can overgrow and affect human uh, human health as well as impact the water supply, which of course will then just turn around and impact human health as well. The um, the illnesses can be associated also with the type of chemicals, the amount, the duration, the root, the immune status of the individual. Um, inhalation is always a, an important an important route of exposure for indoor environments, uh, and therefore we're very interested in, in seeing if we could uh, take samples that would have. Uh, help us evaluate the impact on the respiratory tract of, of some of these exposures. Um, all this is being taken into consideration. Um, we wanted to recruit individuals who have been affected. So there's a number, as, as bad as the storm was, there was definitely areas of Houston, as I'll show you in a moment, there were areas that were much more affected than others. Um, so we wanted to make sure we were engaging those communities. Um, and so we also want to engage children as well. So those who were five and older were, were asked to participate in the study if their parents consented. Um, those who were either living in a flooded home or, or were involved in cleanup as a result, result of Harvey. Um, on the other side of the equation, we, we had limited resources and uh, therefore we limited, limited our recruitment to one adult, one child per household. Um, uh, it was the response and the engagement has been great so far, and so it's, uh, we actually have to be, you know, be mindful of how many people we take in from one small, from one house itself, and so we wanted to distribute our resources appropriately. So we had two arms, two arm in, ter in terms of recruitment, in terms of recruitment groups. One uh, arm involved people who were no longer exposed, but who were sort of initially. In, um, had been exposed to flood waters or, or flood damage. Um, we, we started the enrollment process about 30 days out. So these are people that were probably helping others, but probably didn't have home damage themselves. Um, we had them complete a health questionnaire and provide samples for microbiome studies. This included fecal samples, oral uh, saliva samples, and a nasal swab. The second arm um, were those who were in, under more long-term exposure. Uh, and these are people who had the same type of information and samples collected, but also had a were given a silicone wristband um, from the Anderson Group at o Oregon State. So I mentioned that she had a really interesting contribution. Uh, she's developed a wristband that can uh, passively sample over 1,500 organic compounds uh, um, that, that that band is exposed to. So as you're wearing it on the wrist, um, that wristband will take in the chemicals that you're identify or you're exposed to, as well as how your body reacts to them in terms of what's secreted from your skin. So it's looking at both the, the exposure as well as some of the response to that exposure, at least as, it, as at least as it's passed through the skin. Uh, very interesting, and some a lot of data that could be correlated now with our microbiome data and our questionnaire data. Uh, a home sample is also collected from those that were under current and constant exposure. Um, we developed a questionnaire to capture general information from each study participant. Uh, so sociodemographic data, exposure data, uh, how much you participated in, in bioremediation activities, um, any current health, uh, health uh, impact, um, environmental health, so information about the environment that you're currently living in, and some diet information so we had a baseline to, to look at with your microbiome data. Um, the exposure log uh, is just an example of some of the information that was collected in terms of uh, what you were living in, what you were cleaning, and, and what the remediation process was for your area. Um, and the wristbands that were passed out were then uh, worn for a week and then brought back uh, to the collection site uh, that, that following weekend. 
the wristbands themselves, I had just a little bit more information about uh, about them and some of the information that were uh, provided and, and some of Kim's, uh, Dr. Anderson's uh, personnel shown on the right-hand side. Uh, these bands can collect information about um, uh, both person, personal care products, uh, various chlorinated uh, chemicals, pesticides, polycyclic aromatics, um, and it can be worn while you're doing all sorts of things. It's just worn throughout the week, so you're able to collect all the exposures that you that you potentially were uh, associated with for that period of time. From a microbiome perspective, we've, we've had years of experience uh, in working with groups that have found ways to help collect microbiome samples that would keep them stable uh, during transit, especially when there was no refrigerated conditions at the time. And so we were using um, fecal collection kits, oral nasal swabs, um, uh, a saliva passive collection, and a home swab where uh, people could sample specific areas uh, of their homes. The idea was to launch a study within 30 days of, of Hurricane Harvey and then um, begin to collect information about uh, first of all, collect information from the individuals involved and then to assess how that original collection went to inform a secondary time point um, 12 months later where we can collect more uh, more samples from the same 150 individuals that were sampled uh, in September of 2017. So we're coming up on that right now. Um, and another 150 individuals who we're going to add a cross-sectional measure to to get, again, more information about what people were exposed to and how it impacted the microbiome. Um, as well. So you have 150 people sampled twice, and then another 150 sam people sampled a year, a year out one time. Um, and then all the data are going to be integrated uh, to look at potential associations with exposures uh, to potentially identify uh, ways in which we, the uh, responses to, to uh, these types of events could perhaps be improved. The participating in communities are shown here. So Overall, this is a map of Harris County. Um, so this is all of Houston. Actually, it's not even all of Houston, but it's mostly Houston, um, or most of Houston. Um, so I'm going to refer to a couple of these communities repeatedly. And, and so to kind of give you that, at, at the left, the highlighted community that's uh, labeled number one is an area called Attics in West Houston. Um, I'll talk about a little bit of some of the demographics in a second. On the right side of the, uh, of the east side of the map is um, is Baytown, uh, where a lot of our petrochemical plants sit. Uh, East Houston is number two, it's sort of in the middle. Uh, and we also sampled uh, people that were affected who belong to the Baylor College of Medicine community. And there's actually a number of them. And I'll talk about, we'll, I'll have a map to show specifically where people were living at, at this time, or at the time of sampling. The, um, they're also indicated in red stars on this uh, slide, the active Superfund sites, so known chemical or other toxic uh, uh, waste uh, repositories that are under federal management for cleanup um, that potentially could have been compromised during the storm. If we look at the populations themselves, again, addicts, uh, the addicts area is sort of middle income Baytown was a site that was close to two Superfund sites. East Houston is a, a lower income uh, area of the community and, and mostly of minority uh, population. And then Baylor employees, again, was the fourth category. If we look at the where these people were located, um, there were centers at each site where people came in and were sampled. But of course, people could come in from all over to have, uh, if, most of the people at the sites we, we chose for sample and information collection were, of course, centralized in the areas I mentioned, but uh, some of these people were living further away, uh, and so we wanted to make sure we collected that information as well uh, as we began to make our association, uh, conclude, draw our conclusions from our associations. And so the individuals, as they're broken down by uh, the recruitment centers and where they actually lived are shown here. Demographics of these areas are, are indicated here. I'm not sure if this if we really need to spend a lot of time on this, but again, you can see the medium income of the, of the household income uh, at the bottom, um, and overall Harris County, which is sort of representative of the Baylor College Medicine uh, uh, Medicine Group. Um, you can see the breakdown of male female. They're all normal splits as you would ma uh, imagine. But just to give you an idea again of all the metadata that we're collecting. Um, and associate, associating with the exposures uh, and the health risks uh, that will come out at the end of the study. I think it's important to underscore that. 
So we began, the first collection site was actually at Baylor. This is sort of where you get your feet under you in terms of sampling a lot of individuals. You get a feel for how this is impacting people that are still actively going through their cleanup and remedi remediation uh, of, of, from the storm. Um, a questionnaire was sent out to all employees, uh, over 8,000 people, and 400 responded uh, within a week. And, and some of them were the, among those who were then sampled. So on top of the actual sampling, we're collecting a lot of other sort of survey data that could be layered on top of these analyses in this program as well. 60% um, of the responders had homes that were uninhabitable, uninhabitable or destroyed, uh, and 38% were actually trying to work their way through uh, living while their home was still partially flooded. I'm gonna to touch base really quickly on a few of these other sites, attics, um, again, we located a church uh, in the community that was a hub for uh, muck and gut uh, activities. And these are these are people that come out and volunteer to help people, other people who are affected, clean out their homes, cut out the drywall, uh, and get them in a place where they can start the rebuilding process. Um, and so we had uh, two recruitment sessions. Uh, the ones that were a week later were mainly to collect samples that were uh, wristbands and fecal samples after they were collected and brought back. Similar situation in Baytown, uh, partnering with a church that was uh, where many parishioners' homes were affected by the floodwaters. Again, had a, two uh, collection center, uh, sessions a week apart. East Houston was a um, actually a delivery recovery uh, center uh, that was sort of set up to serve the community residents. Um, again, collected one weekend, uh, collected samples one weekend, wristbands the next weekend. Um, just to give you an idea of how many people enrolled and how many belong to the arm one versus arm two uh, who got the wristbands. Uh, you can see that a lot of people were still living in homes that were damaged, uh, the arm two group. Uh, overall collected 208 participants. So we'll over collect uh, initially to, to ensure that when we go back out in the community now uh, that we can get at least 150 people for two time points. Wristbands came back at a 90% rate. So that was uh, that was exciting to compliance is always an important feature when you're building a cohort of any kind. Microbiome samples, over 658, um, oh, 658 microbiome samples are collected from the first round. Uh, you can see how they were broken down from nasal saliva, fecal, and environmental. I'm gonna talk a little bit now in the last uh, nine or 10 minutes that I have left uh, about some of the information that was collected from the microbiome samples. And just to remind those, uh, this is, I believe, a broad audience. I'm gonna talk a little bit about alpha diversity. And that is, um, when we look at the microbiome data, can we look at how many different taxa are present uh, in, a in a particular community or a particular sample type? So this is basically the number of different species or genera that are found in a particular organ, a particular community, and then their evenness. How well are they distrib distributed? Are they relatively the same numbers of everything that's there, uh, or are there large disparities in the abundance uh, of particular taxa in the community? And that's reflected in a couple measures I'll talk about in a moment. We'll talk a little bit about my microbial taxonomy. What's there? What the names of the organisms that are particular that are there, and then comparison between samples, uh, community makeup, and so basically looking at the different organisms and the relative abundances in a particular in a sample, and then comparing that with all other samples to see how related the samples are, uh, how much they resemble one another uh, from sample to sample. So the first measure we took this is now looking at bacterial 16S data, which limits us pretty much to obs observational taxonomic units. That's uh, akin to species, um, but gives us sort of a, 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 a 97% identity between the 16S sequences that were looked at. This is before sequencing uh, and comparing them um, across the different sample types. We identified uh, in the observed OTU, again, op uh, operational taxonomic unit, um, difference, uh, differences between samples. You can see that there are a lot of different, about 200 different uh, OTUs in an environmental sample versus uh, fewer in the nasal slide and stool samples. Um, we look at the diversity index. Again, those, our environmental samples uh, turned out to be uh, very diverse, uh, as you'd imagine, uh, compared to those that are found in niches of the body. I should mention these data just recently. This first analysis, again, is the first time point. So this is from September 2017. Um, 
you know, the samples collected, extracted, sequenced, uh, primary analyses were recently derived uh, uh, and we're going through them. Uh, one of the first groups to see this see this data. So um, some of the stories have not been borne out uh, beyond what we're talking about here yet. Um, there seem to be some differences in uh, the alpha diversity, uh, the different numbers of organisms present in their distribution and, and de depending on where you were located. And so the locations are indicated in the key on the right as a respect to color. Um, they correspond to letters on the bottom of the slides as well. So A is addicts, B is Baytown, E is Baylor College of Medicine, and H is uh, East Houston. They'll be used repeatedly throughout the talk. Um, again, the, the so what we did see is that samples that came from East Houston did seem to have a uh, slightly different, uh, slightly higher diversity uh, in nasal and saliva compared to um, compared to the other communities. Don't know what that means. We just right now this is a descriptive stage of the study. As you'd imagine, this, if we look at beta diversity now, how the how with each dot representing the composition of each uh, sample, so the organisms that are there and their relative abundance. If you're looking at a weighted analysis um, versus an unweighted analysis, which is just comparing the organisms that are present and at, absent. Uh, if you're looking at this, there are uh, samples are labeled by body type, uh, uh, sample type, and so those are shown in the. Uh, the key, the environmental nasal saliva oral, um, sorry, uh, environmental nasal saliva uh, and stool. And as you'd imagine, they, the communities that are present in each type of sample are unique to that type of sample. They cluster together, as you can see. Uh, interestingly, the environmental uh, and nasal uh, communities seem to be closer together, at least when you look at the unweighted analysis, that's just the presence and absence of organisms, suggesting that some of the exposures that are coming from the environment have the first impact or the most impact on the nasal communities. Um, that's normally the case, and so it just reminds us the fact that if there's things that are potentially toxic in the environment or potentially pathogenic in the environment, the first, first body site that will see them is, is going to be the will be the nasal uh, cavity. These data start to compare the uh, beta diversity, so the composition of each sample by location. Uh, it's hard to see here, and it's uh, we're not rotating or using animations at this point in time, but there were some, some features as you rotate these three-dimensional plots that made it look like you can actually see some clustering by area, specifically if you're looking at East Houston. Uh, if you look at the saliva, uh, data itself at the lower right. Um, if you actually were able to rotate this, you can see that the, the East Houston is all more coming out of the screen. Um, and in that case, may have some features that differentiate it from the other saliva samples from other communities. It's an ongoing analysis, um, uh, not not readily seen perhaps in the way it's depicted here, but there, there are some features that suggest that there's some unique uh, taxa that are present in each community. Um, similarly, if you look at this now with a, a weighted measure, uh, so that was unweighted, presence and absence of organisms. This is now looking at the relative abundance of organisms. Similarly, you're going to, we start to see, uh, if you rotate these around, there may be some associations by, by area, but we have to look at the, uh, look at this in more detail. As I mentioned, the nasal and environmental samples seem to have some overlap, and so when we focus uh, focus the, on those alone. You can see that in the unweighted presence and absence, weighted, including relative abundance um, uh, of those communities, so that there's some environmental and nasal organisms that are being shared. The top ten most abundant bacteria in the environment are found in all environments. So if there's if there are differences, it's not at the most abundant uh, organism level, and so these are the top ten. Um, uh, bacterial genera that were found in each uh, each of the communities and how they relate to one another um, from top, from area to area. They're all found in each area. Um, and then looking at the, these top 10 uh, genera uh, and how they are present in other sample types. And so we do see that environmental organisms, and these are their abundances are in blue, uh, are actually found in nasal saliva and even stool samples in some cases suggesting that there are shared taxa uh, for, with our environment and the samples that are collected uh, from them. Now, again, this is going to be normally the case. Our environment has a huge impact on the microbes that are 
uh, on us and in us. But the question will become as we move further into this analysis as to how, how many of them are actually harmful for us or are any of them harmful harmful to us? Are they associated with health, health risk? Are they associated with specific exposures uh, in the environment? We also started to look at fun, fungi, and so the ITS2 is a, akin to the 16S uh, marker gene, uh, ribosome RNA gene in humans, uh, sorry, in bacteria. The ITS2 is an inter internal transcribed spacer region of the ribosomal uh, RNA in fungi and eukaryotes. And so we sequenced this uh, to be able to start to discern what the fungal communities look like in these samples. And so again, initially looking at environment and nasal swabs, uh, the saliva and stool are, uh, data are yet to come. Um, you can see that there's a large, again, large number of taxa that are found in the, in the observed OTUs uh, in the environment samples. Um, and then nasal also has a large number of fungal OTUs, um, not quite as much as in the environmental samples. Um, again, great diversity found in the East Houston samples. I'm not sure what this uh, necessarily means at the moment, but both in the nasal uh, especially in the nasal swab, uh, there seems to be more fungal taxa that are present uh, in that community. If you look at the diversity, beta diversity in nasal environmental swabs, you can see that there is some overlap. Um, look, looking at uh, each of the areas in, in heat that were sampled, uh, there's some taxa that for sure overlap with the environmental samples, and of course there's many others that do not. Um, as we look at the taxa specifically, we'll be able to dissect this even more. Again, another nasal environmental uh, beta diversity plots that are showing how the nasal fungi seem to be, if you look at specifically at the right, how the fungi and the nasal swab seem to be offset from the, uh, in the East Houston, seem to be offset from other areas of the city. Taxonomically, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly so we have time for questions, but um, if you look at the environmental samples at the top and the nasal samples at the bottom, the taxa, they're color-coded onto the, on the right. Um, you can see that there are some taxa that are shared. Uh, some of these taxa uh, have been associated with uh, incidences of al uh, allergy and asthma. And so it'll be interesting to see some of the health out outcomes as they associate with these environmental and nasal samples uh, moving forward. Um, again, the, the, as we look at the, these particular data, um, the top 10 fungal genera uh, in the environment uh, is found in the nose. And so all these were found in the environment. How many of these were found in nasal swabs? Um, curval, curvalaria is a highly abundant is in, in the animal samples, and it's also detected in the nasal samples. And so more abundant in East Houston. So just an example of how we're tying location, environmental sample, and nasal samples together. Um, and we'll tie this back to health outcome, outcomes moving forward. So the next steps of all of this, so that was just, a, again, very descriptive, very high-level taxonomic profiles of the organisms that are present. Um, what's next is to start to tie these um, this descriptive data to the demographics, the, the health histories, the diet of individuals, to the chemical exposures and other exposure information that we're collecting to be able to look at what biomarkers, what taxa, um, are associated potentially with these exposures and health outcomes to, to better inform what could be done in the responses moving forward. We have a 12 month sampling point that's beginning uh, right now, actually in the, within the next week. Uh, actually, one site's already been reviewed, uh, resampled and we're moving to the other two uh, shortly. Um, and then the Protocols that we're using today uh, have been informed by the protocols and how they worked last year. So again, you refine your study method without without changing the actual samples that are being collected because you don't want to introduce bias into, into how the data uh, may look from one year to the year prior. Um, but in terms of how best to engage the community, uh, those changes have been implemented uh, to the sample time. We also want to also mention we all are wanting to return data back to the subjects uh, so that they can understand uh, at a population level how their how this research will impact um, how how this research will impact them both in terms of information about the exposures uh, that they're they're all living through and how this potential could be turned into better uh, better responses to disaster moving forward. Lots of ongoing and planned analyses moving forward. Um, there's other ta other 
pieces of information that we can bring in that were not part of the actual study design. So information about the Superfund sites, petrochemical facilities, uh, there's a urban data platform of air quality and other compounds that can be also brought in to look at these exposures as it relates to the microbiome. I mentioned the roast band analyses are coming back uh, as well as additional information about the microbiome and microbiome uh, from the data that are that are that are at hand. And so with that, um, I know we kind of whizzed through some of the initial analyses, but of course happy to answer any questions moving forward and those that may not even come up today but later in the future. Couldn't have done this without the help of the laboratory as well as um, the Center for Precision, Precision Environmental Health and Cheryl Walker's group, Kim Anderson at Oregon State University, and Elaine and Amal at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petrosino, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click the send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, we know that the functions of the organisms found in a microbiome sample are important. Are there planned analysis to study the gene content of these samples as well? So yes, um, we have a, a, a number of, again, we have already over 650 samples that have been collected. Um, we wanted to get an initial profile using 16S and ITS2 sequence data about what is in these samples. but. As the question suggests, the functions, the things that these organisms are actually doing is what's most important in these types of analyses. And so in order to do that, we will do whole genome shotgun sequencing on these samples, uh, look at the gene content of all the, of these communities, begin to associate those genetic functions with the outcomes that we've talked about, the exposures we've talked about, the wristband data, to look at what functions are selected in these particular types of environments and exposures. Now, Dr. Petrosino, are there plans to look at viruses in these samples? That's a good question. So the viruses, as I mentioned before, is, is an important component of, of the microbiome. Uh, initially, it was uh, maybe understudied or underrepresented, but now there's a number of studies that have launched in the space. Um, with the samples that we have in hand, we don't have virus analyses uh, uh, planned. We have banked samples, primary sample that's left where we can go back with perhaps additional resources uh, and study the viruses that are in the samples and integrate that into the analyses that we talked about. Now, it looks like we have time for one more question. Will samples be collected from individuals who do or have become sick to see if the etiologic agent was found in the local environment? Uh, also an interesting question. So. Um, as I mentioned, we, we, we have some initial exposure information, so environmental organisms that seem to be associated with organisms found on uh, the body sites that we've studied. But if people become sick, um, if an etiologic agent is discovered, can we go back and see if that, if that organism is found in the environment uh, uh, at that particular location? Um, the subjects have been consented for reconsent uh, to be have been consented in their IRB as part of the consent process to be part of the study. They have been uh, asked if they would be like to be uh, recontacted should such an event occur. Uh, those that uh, that indicated that they would, uh, we would be able to go back and, and, and collect those samples and potentially make that kind of a connection. I would like to once again thank Dr. Petrosino for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.